want to take just a moment before we look into this last session in the Word of God. And I want to talk to you a moment about what happens when you leave here. Because there's often times I find the greatest testings come after the greatest victories. You come to a conference like this, and like when you left home on Thursday or Friday, whenever you left, you were like all worried about your kids and your whatever, and now you've forgotten you have kids. I mean, it's like... <laughs> and you kind of get the feeling of Peter and James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they see the glory of God, and this is amazing, and Peter says, oh Lord, can't we just move up here? I mean, let's just live here forever. Well, the problem is they have a service here tonight, and we, they're going to shoo us out of here, you got to go home. And that's what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, look, you can't, you're not supposed to stay up here. You're supposed to go down in that valley at the foot of this mountain, and you're supposed to take the glory that you've seen and make it work down there. Because there's a man down there with a son who's demon-possessed, and he has no idea what to do. I mean, there's real-life problems, and some of you are going home to some hard real-life problems. Some of you are going back to great churches that love Jesus and are alive, but some of you are going back to churches that they're just like playing church. And you're so discouraged. Some of you are going back to a workplace on Monday morning where it's just like, what? This is craziness. <laughs> and some of you are going back to like, you trusted your husband to like be the man of the house, the, the adult with your kids, and then you find out you did what with the kids? Could you just purpose, I'm telling you this now, but in 24 hours you're going to thank me. <laughs> purpose to breathe grace in and breathe grace out. If your kids are still alive, it's okay. And here's another thing. You know, God's shown you some things, and I want to encourage you not to go home and like, or to your roommate or to your small group or whatever and, and say, um, you know, boy, just like unload on them everything you learned and you should have been there and I'm mad that you weren't there and you should have had, you know, just settle down. <laughs> and let God make what we've talked about a way of life in you and that's what will make the biggest difference. God had who he wanted at this conference. That's you and me. And the other people who weren't here, we think, oh, they needed to hear this. God knows what they need is to see it lived out in us. So be praying for each other. In fact, before you leave here, um, if you came with a friend, maybe purpose to pray for each other, maybe every day for the next week, or if you met somebody new here, just or you meet somebody as you're leaving, just say, exchange names, text each other, just pray for each other, encourage each other. Um, as we, because, you know, sometimes the enemy can take that seed that has been planted and can steal it. And Jesus said, if you deal with the negative, the evil spirits in your life, but you don't replace them with truth, then you're going to have an empty home. There's going to be a vacuum there in your heart. And more enemies and evil things are going to come in than you ever thought before. Some of you, a year from now, you're going to be in a better place spiritually because you're walking in humility, you're walking in forgiveness, you're drinking from the well that satisfies. But some of you, <laughs> praise the Lord for that, some of you are going to be in a worse place because you got exposed to the truth, but then you let it go. So I want you to be in a good place a year from now. I want you to be in a good place a month from now, 10 years from now. And that means that the things we've talked about, this is not just a weekend experience. This is a way of life. And here's the thing. Thank God for Virtue um, Women's Ministry and for these Bible studies. Get in a Bible study. Get into the Word of God yourself. Don't just let others feed you, but get into it. Let it change you. And by the way, Revive Our Hearts, we're here to serve you um, to any way we can encourage you. Uh, K-Wave every day at 2.30 in the afternoon. You can listen to Revive Our Hearts. If that time doesn't work for you, go to reviveourhearts.com. You can listen. We're there to serve, to give you just kind of this daily drip, drip, drip. I'm not a drip, but... <laughs> That didn't quite come out right. <laughs> Just truth flowing into it. We need it. Like, like the world is an IV in our arms, right? And all the time, day in and day out, the world is telling us how we ought to think, how we ought to respond, what ought to matter to us. But that's why we need the Word of God like an IV 
in our system. So these Bible studies, this daily program, you can listen to it. You can listen on the podcast. You can um, read the transcripts of Revive Our Hearts each day. It's there to serve you. Go to the website. Go to your pastor's wife. Say, here's what I'm struggling with. Here's an area where I have a need. And get help. Don't try and do this Christian life thing on your own because you can't and you won't. But with the people of God together, we can. So thank you for honoring us uh, with your presence and your involvement this weekend and your heartfelt response. And now I want to close our time. And let me, one more thing. Kathy and Tiffany, she's probably out working somewhere. She always is. And the Virtue Women and the Serve Team and the volunteers and the praying partners and Ricky and his team, aren't you thankful for all these who've blessed us this weekend? Thank God. Kathy and I think, we never met till this week, but I think we're like twins separated at birth because we got the same heart and that's a heart to serve you and a heart that's so grateful for God's grace in our lives. Now, I want to end our conference by telling you a love story. Aw. <laughs> Everybody loves a love story. In fact, would you like to know just a little bit about my love story? Yes. Oh, okay then. <laughs> okay, here's a short version. I had never married till age 57. I loved... The Lord, I loved being, I loved serving the Lord as a single woman. I felt that was a gift. I felt it was a calling. And I know most single women don't feel quite that way about singleness. I get that. I think you're more normal than I was. But I was a champion of marriage, but I just didn't think that's what God had for me. And I found great joy in doing what the Lord had called me to do. And uh, along the way, um, Kathy, did you, you told this story about Robert being my agent. Did you tell that this morning? I, I, lo I lost track of it. Robert, is, I'm an author, and Robert's a literary agent, and back in the early 2000s, he represented me for a couple of years, and then he taught one of the men on our team how to negotiate the contracts and whatever, and so we decided we didn't need an agent anymore. So we fired him. <laughs> and then fast forward. I had met Robert and his wife, Bobby. They were married for almost 45 years. And they had been on the Revive Our Hearts broadcast um, talking about the importance of singing as a family, singing hymns. And some of you remember what hymns are. Um, <laughs> And so I knew them not real well, but somewhat. And then Bobby was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. And for the next couple of years, um, she struggled with that, went through all kinds of treatment and with amazing grace. Just God used her in, in, and Robert in such a way in so many hospitals and doctor's offices. And, um, and, and Robert was sending out emails just updating people in the Christian publishing world about uh, how to pray, and so I was getting those emails, and we were just lifting Bobby and Robert up to the Lord, and then the Lord took Bobby home, and I watched actually the live stream of the memorial service. It was a precious service. Their two 40-something daughters got up and gave an amazing tribute to their mother. It was just so moving, and I'm, we actually aired part of that um, service on Revive Our Hearts because I said, this is, I want women to hear what it is to die well and to pass on the baton to your children well. So I had been following this story, but still just never thinking that God would have marriage for me. And then Mr. Wagamuth came back into my life and he said, could we be friends? And I said, much to my surprise, yes, I would like that. And God began to quicken in my heart to awaken love that had never been awakened before. I said to him in that first meeting, if, because we, we talked about marriage from the, I mean, at our age, you know, you like. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, the, if, if I were to, if the Lord has marriage for us, God's going to have to awaken something in me that has never been awakened before. And God began to do that. Now, two months after we started dating, as we were realizing that, yes, God did, was leading us toward marriage, two friends of Bobby's 
said to Robert, there's something we think you need to know. Before Bobby died, she had told these two friends in two separate conversations, I hope that Robert will marry Nancy Lee DeMoss. <laughs> and she never told him, which I'm kind of glad about that part. And so they came and said, we think you need to know this. And that was a sweet confirmation that this, what a gift that was for Bobby to give to Robert and me. So three months after we started dating, I'm giving you like the short version, we got engaged. We kind of had to because like the word was getting out and we, you know, got a public ministry, wanted to keep it private and we couldn't. So we said, this is happening, let's get engaged. And six months after that, we were married and I think we have... Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Honey, stand up. I want these women to see you. I love you so much. We just celebrated a big anniversary. You want to tell them, honey? 40 months. Our 40th. We celebrate months because that's the only way we can catch up with all our friends. <laughs> so, 40 months, that's amazing. It is amazing. And you're amazing. Thank and you. I am so, so grateful for this man and God. Listen, you can trust the Lord to write your story. And that's the book we've just written. Look for it in September. You can trust God to write your story. Not just your love story, but every chapter of your life. Robert tells a story about, at one point, losing his business. You can trust the Lord with your finances. He tells a story about losing a wife to cancer. You can trust God with health issues. You can trust God with singleness issues, marriage issues, infertility issues. Um, you can trust God to write your story. And right. he's writing ours. God says, I've prayed this with a couple of women today. The word says, those who wait for him, those who trust in him, will never be disappointed, will never be put to shame. So, there you go. Tell them about your mother. <laughs> he said, tell them about your mother. Um, well, my mother just turned 80 last year, Robert turned 70, and I turned 60. So when we were dating, I said to Robert, my mother is also named Nancy, and she's been widowed for 40 years. So I said to him, honey, if this doesn't work out with us, my mother is still available. I love you. See, everybody loves a love story. And the story we're living is not one I would have ever written for myself. But how many of us can say that? The story we're living isn't the one we would have written. And sometimes it's the sweet, fun stuff like this, but sometimes it's the really hard stuff. You can trust God to write your story. Well, we all love love stories. Most of us grew up loving Cinderella, the story of the rejected stepsister who ends up marrying a prince. Some of you watch The Sound of Music every time it comes on TV, right? Even though you can watch it on YouTube or Netflix or whatever, anytime you want, but sound of music. And then some of you are followers of royal weddings. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember when like almost the whole world got up to watch the royal wedding in the middle of the night in the States of Prince Charles and Princess Diana. And Robert and I were together this past year when Prince Harry and Meghan Markle got married. I mean, everybody loves a love story, right? But each of those stories has a problem. The problem with Cinderella is that it's a fairy tale. It didn't happen. <laughs> the problem with The Sound of Music, it's actually based on a true story, but it happened to someone else. It happened to Maria, not to me. We think that could never happen to me. And then some of these amazing royal weddings, think of Prince Charles and Princess Diana, what started out as the wedding of the 20th century ended in tragedy and disaster. Some of you started out in your marriage, with stars in your eyes, the promise of undying love and devotion, only to have that dream shattered in great disappointment and loss and pain. People are desperate for love. 
They're desperate for intimacy. They want to know, does anybody love me? Does anybody care? Do I matter to anyone? Well, I want to tell you in the moments we have remaining, a love story that is different than any other love story you have ever heard or experienced. It's a story of a love between God and his people. It's a story found in this book, in the Bible. In fact, from the very opening pages to the final pages of this book, the, this is one great, big, long love story. If you read it that way, you'll see it through different eyes. God so loved the world. And unlike Cinderella, this story is not a fairy tale. It's true. And unlike the sound of music, this story is not just for somebody else. It's for me. It's for you. And unlike some of these famous weddings that then end in disaster and disappointment, the ending of this story will be even more glorious than its beginning. Now, I want to take a few moments here and read to you this love story. Well, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'd like to read a bit of it. And I'm going to read a little bit from the Old Testament book of the Song of Solomon, something you don't often hear at, in church or at a women's conference, and then a few verses from the New Testament. So again, as I read, can I just ask you to stand so we can honor the Word of God? And we're picking up in the Song of Solomon. These are just some uh, verses that I have pieced together. We actually had these verses read at the beginning of our wedding 40 months ago, and you're hearing a conversation between a bride and her groom, and it starts out with the bride saying, the voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved spoke and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. He says to her, O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. And then the bride says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feeds among the lilies. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. And then the groom says, you are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one of your eyes. And then the bride says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. And then we come to the New Testament in the book of Ephesians. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And then in the last book of this love story, the book of Revelation, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, write this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. One of the seven angels said to me, come, I will show you the bride the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. And then we hear the words of the groom. Behold, 
I am coming soon. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates of the city. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. So we're ending today where we started last night. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Here's where I want to head in the moments we have remaining. I want to talk about the bride. I want to talk about the bridegroom. And I want to talk about getting ready for the wedding. The bride. If you are a child of God, now if you're maybe a new Christian or not a Christian at all, you're thinking, this sounds really weird. Hold on. Buckle up. You're going to get it. The scripture says that if you are a child of God, you are a part of the bride of Christ. Now, you may not feel or act sometimes or look very bride-like, especially when you've been crying your mascara off all day, right? But the scripture says that you are his bride if you are a child of God. Now, what does it mean to be the bride of Christ? What does practically that mean for us? Well, first it means that you are loved, that he loves you. He loved you so much that he gave himself for you. And, and his love is not based on your worth. It's not based on your performance. It's just the fact that he is a lover. He loves you. It means that he has chosen you. And the only qualification that you have to be chosen by him is that you have no qualifications. It's all, all, all of grace. Your need is what qualifies you to be chosen by him. I just read some excerpts from the Song of Solomon. Let me just give you in a nutshell the story of the Song of Solomon. It's a story about a king. It's just eight short chapters. Story about a king, royalty. He decides he wants to find a bride. And so you can imagine that all the women in the city began to think, who might he choose to be his bride? And I can imagine some woman saying, well, I graduated first in my class at the University of Jerusalem. I'm smart, surely he's gonna choose me. And then another woman's thinking to herself, well, she may be brilliant, but I'm beautiful. And that's what he's going to choose in the end. I won Miss Jerusalem, and I'm up for Miss Israel, and surely he's going to choose me. And maybe someone else is thinking, well, she's beautiful, and she's brilliant, but I have blue blood. I mean, I got royalty in my blood, so he's a king. He's going to surely choose me. Listen, much to the surprise of all these women, the king didn't choose any of them. Instead, he left the palace, he left the capital city, and he went out into the countryside, into a backwoods rural area. And there he found a woman who was out working on her family farm in the vineyards. And he said to her, I want you to be my bride. Now, no one was more surprised than this woman because she would not have at all considered that he might have chosen her. She, throughout the book, she's, she's asking in different ways, why did you choose me? You know what, he never gives an answer. The only answer he gives is, I love you, I chose you. In those days to have fair skin, pale skin, was, that was what the royal women had. It's the working class women who had the skin that had been darkened by the sun. And she says in chapter one of Song of Solomon, she says, my skin is dark. It's not an ethnic thing here. It's just like I'm, my, my hands are coarse. I've been out working. I'm a working girl. I don't have this beautiful fair skin. He doesn't care. He thinks she's beautiful. And so he takes her back to the palace, to Jerusalem, into the palace. He marries her. He lavishes his, his love upon her. He becomes her bridegroom. He makes her his bride. And an amazing thing happens throughout the Song of Solomon. By the time you get to the end, this man's love has beautified this bride. And she becomes so beautiful that the daughters of Jerusalem are looking at her in amazement, saying, She's gorgeous. 
You see, the love of Christ, the love of a good man can beautify a woman who's responsive to it. But the love of Christ, that's the biggest point of this story. Yes, it's about human earthly marriage and how beautiful that is in God's way and God's time, but it's about a bigger story, a greater story about the love of Christ and how it changes us. It's transformational. And I can't think about the story of the Song of Solomon without thinking about how when I was a four-year-old girl, without knowing all the theological terms, you know what? I've been not even seeing you over here signing. Thank you so much, you women who've been doing this. Sorry, but is this amazing? Bless you. Thank you so much. So many people serve around here. It's just beautiful. Well, where was I? I was four years old. And I became, it's getting late. I'm getting giddy. But I really am thankful. I knew that Jesus wanted to save me and make me his own. I didn't know any big fancy words. I was by myself. And I just gave all that I knew of me to all that I knew of Jesus. And he came into my life. He saved me. He made me a new person. He said, I want, to be, I want you to be my bride, he said to me. In, without saying that. But that was what he was offering to me. And now these 56 years almost been living and walking as his bride. And you know what? I've never gotten over the wonder of the fact that he would have chosen me. I don't get it. I, 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 like, why? He doesn't give me an answer. He just says, I love you. I chose you. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. To be the bride of Christ means that he loves you. It means that he's chosen you. It means that he delights in you. We read this in the Song of Solomon. It says, on the day of his wedding, his heart rejoiced. Isaiah 62, verse 5, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Zephaniah 3, 17, the Lord your God will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. It means he delights in you. There are women in this room who've never felt that another human being really delighted in you. But I'm telling you, you have a savior, a heavenly bridegroom, if you belong to him, who takes great delight in you. It means if you're his bride that you belong to him, that you're not your own. Scripture says he paid a great price to purchase us as his bride, the bride price, the dowry. It was the shedding of his lifeblood. It means that he desires an intimate relationship with you. He says to this bride, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. He wants to be with her. He wants to know her and be known by her. It means that he wants to reveal his beauty and his glory in and through us to others. So that when people see us so in love with Jesus, they think, I want that kind of relationship. You see, we're not the sun we're just like the moon reflecting the glory and the beauty of the sun as we reflect as the people of God, the beauty and the glory of Christ. You see, ladies, to be the bride of Christ gives our lives purpose and meaning and perspective. It affects everything from the minute you wake up in the morning till the minute you go to bed at night. Now, I'll be the first to admit that a lot of days down here don't seem very much like a wedding. That's why we need to look ahead to the end of the story, which we're going to do in just a moment. But having looked at the bride, I want to take a moment to look at the bridegroom. You go to some weddings today, any wedding, and what's the focus of attention? The bride. People may not even remember who the bridegroom was or what he looked like, but they're remembering every detail about the bride. But in this wedding, 
God's royal wedding, the bridegroom is the center of all the attention. It's all for him. We read in Revelation that the bride, the, the, the church of Christ is beautifully dressed for her husband. The danger is that while we're down here on this earth waiting for this wedding to come, that we would get our eyes off of him. We would lose our focus and forget why we are here. In fact, in the Song of Solomon, there are a couple of instances where the bride loses her sense of the bridegroom's presence, which is something that happens in, if you've been a Christian any longer than probably a week or a month or a few months, you've experienced what it is to sense, like the, you felt so much of the presence of God early in your Christian life, but then there comes a point where you think, where is he? He doesn't seem as close as he did once. And so this bride goes searching for her bridegroom in the Song of Solomon. And she says to everyone she finds, have you seen him? Have you seen him? Do you know where he is? I've lost him. I don't know where he is. She's like earnestly seeking to get the relationship restored. And at one point, the daughters of Jerusalem, these are kind of the supporting actresses here, they say to her, what is your beloved more than any other beloved? Like you've lost him? Isn't there somebody else who could do? And so the bride begins to Think about what it is that, she's, that she loves, that she values, that is so precious to her about her bridegroom. What is it that she misses? And she describes in great detail what it is that attracts her to him. And tenderly, she speaks of his head, his hair, his eyes, his hands, his arms, his legs, his body. She says, my beloved is dazzling and ruddy. He is the chief among 10,000. In other words, there's no one else like him. And then she concludes, his mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem. Now I want to come back to the gospel story in the Song of Solomon in just a moment, but can I just give a parenthesis for those in this room who are married? Your marriage may have lost, whether it's been 40 months or 40 years or 40 days, it may have lost some of the shine and wonder of the early days. In fact, some of your marriages are hanging by a thread. And you're not at all relating to my love story or this love story or any other love story because you say there is no love in our story anymore. I want to encourage you to remember what it was that first attracted you to that man. Now, oftentimes, it was the opposite things, right? And you're like this really outgoing woman, and the thing you loved about this guy when you were dating was that he was so quiet. <laughs> Until you'd been married six months, and he hadn't said anything. <laughs> See, the things that draw you to each other can actually become the things that then become wedges in the relationship. Am I telling the truth? So here's what I want you to do. Wherever your marriage is today, you may have a great marriage and thank God for that, but every marriage goes through seasons, through challenges, and I've given this challenge to women over many years and I wanna give it to you today. It's called a 30-day husband encouragement challenge. And if you don't get anything else out of this session, this, if you're married, I actually know women who've said they've done this kind of thing with friends, with family members. You can apply it differently. Uh, but especially for those who are married, 30-day challenge, and there are two sides. There's a negative and a positive side to this challenge. The negative side is for the next 30 days, you can't say anything negative about your husband. <laughs> not to him and not to anybody else about him. Somebody pick up that woman and just fell on the floor back there. <laughs> now, the fact that that challenge got the reaction it did <laughs> says to me that some of you need this challenge <laughs> because you've been looking at your husband through negative glasses, critical eyes. I'm not saying there aren't things to be critical about. I'm not saying he doesn't have negative qualities. He does and you do. Every person does. But you know, you can get caught in a trap, a habit of just focusing on the negative and then it gets so much bigger in your eyes. So for 30 days, you're not gonna say, you can think what you wanna think, but you can't say <laughs> anything negative about your husband to him or to any, not to his mother, not to your mother, not to anybody, okay? But here's the positive part. Every day for the next 30 days, 
I want you to think of something that you admire or appreciate about your husband or something you're grateful for, and I want you to say it to him. And while you're at it, say it to somebody else about him. Now, some of you are thinking, I could not think of 30 things <laughs> to express gratitude for my husband. Okay, then you think of one thing and say it every day for 30 days, okay? <laughs> Now, you say, what will happen in 30 days? I have had thousands of women, many thousands of women take this challenge, and I've received hundreds and hundreds of responses back about what God did in these women's hearts and sometimes in their marriages. You say, is that, is that going to change my marriage? I don't know for sure. Is that going to change my husband? I don't know for sure. It might, because we all thrive under encouragement. But I'll tell you one thing for sure, it will change you you'll begin to see him differently. 30-day husband encouragement challenge. If you want some help, uh, like a 30-day little, there's a, a, each day there's a guide of something to think about, to be grateful for, we have a 30-day husband encouragement challenge guide on reviveourhearts.com. You can Google that, and it'll give you some practical ways to do that. Now, what happens, back to Song of Solomon, what happens to this bride when she begins to think about how wonderful this man is, that she had lost his, felt like he had left her. Well, first of all, the, the intimacy is restored with her beloved. She realizes he hadn't gone anywhere. She just had lost her focus on him. But then something else happened in others. As she's telling the, the, um, the uh, women of, the daughters of Jerusalem, what is so special to her about her beloved, they are taken with this man and they say, tell us where he is, we want to get to know him. <laughs> Listen, what could be a more effective means of evangelism in our world that has no interest in Jesus than to have an in love bride be talking about him at work, at school, in the marketplace, in, every, in the community, at the soccer games, that, um, us telling people what Jesus means to us. And that's what becomes persuasive to them that they want him. And so as we read this bride talking about her magnificent obsession, we realize that we are seeing an unveiling of the splendor and the loveliness of Jesus. That's who the groom is. And so if you ask me, as those women did of this bride, what is your beloved more than any other beloved? I would love to tell you. And I would tell you that he is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Ancient of Days. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's my beloved. He's the bread of life. He's the bright and morning star. I tell you that he's the captain of our salvation. He's the chief cornerstone. He's our counselor. I would tell you he's the door. He's Emmanuel. He's the faithful and true one. He's my fortress. He's a friend of sinners. Aren't you glad about that? I would tell you that my beloved is a good shepherd. And he's a great shepherd. And he's a great high priest. And he's the head over all things. And he's the holy one of God. I would tell you that he is the lamb of God. And he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's the life, and he's the light of the world, and he's the Lord of glory, and he's the lover of my soul. I would tell you he is the man of sorrows. And he's my master, and he's the Messiah, and he's the mighty God, and he's the prince of peace. And he's my redeemer, and he's my refuge in times of trouble. And he's the resurrection and the life, and he's my righteousness, and he's my rock. I would tell you he is my savior. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's my strength. He's my shield. He's my strong tower. He's the son of righteousness risen with healing in his wings. I would tell you he is God's great eternal I am. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords whose kingdom is forever and whose reign will never end. I would tell you his name is wonderful. Jesus my Lord, he's my beloved, he's my friend. That's who he is more than any other beloved. And here's the thing, he's gone to prepare a place for his bride. 
And soon he's coming back to consummate the marriage and take us to live with him forever. So we've talked about the bride, we've talked about the bridegroom, and now I just want to close by, for a few minutes, talking about getting ready for the wedding. Getting ready for the wedding. There's a royal wedding coming. Some of you are familiar with the Jewish culture of the New Testament era and how marriages would often be arranged and the an agreement would be made between the two parties and they would become betrothed. At that point, they were considered legally married. There would be a dowry paid, a covenant established, and they would be considered married. But then the groom would go away. He would go back to his home and he would promise to build a home for his bride, and that one day he would come back and take her to that home that he was preparing. And then they would consummate that marriage physically and would live together as husband and wife. It was often a year between the, the betrothal and the time when he would come and take the bride. But she had to be ready because she didn't know what day or time it would be. Jesus has selected his bride and he's coming for his bride. In fact, I can tell you when. We read about it in the scriptures we read earlier three times. He says, I am coming soon. When is soon? It's soon. I don't know how soon, but I know that it's soon. He's coming to consummate the marriage to his bride, the church. And what are we supposed to be doing in the meantime? Getting ready for the wedding making ourselves, preparing ourselves for his return. We've been left here on earth to get ready for the wedding and to help others get ready for the wedding. Now, maybe something that would help us think about how we do this is to think about what a gal is like when she's engaged. Do we have any engaged women here? I see a hand back there, like flash that ring. That's the left hand, yep. Okay, I don't know if you guys are like this, but I know a lot are. They, when, they, when these girls are engaged, they don't think of anything else. They are consumed day and night with this guy, with this coming marriage. They daydream. They write his name, and then they write their name, and then they write his name with their name. My name got quite a bit longer when I was doing that. They're counting the days, the hours. They're eagerly anticipating, longing for the day when they will be married. They're planning, they're preparing, they want everything to be just right. So they're making lists of their lists. And then there's the dress. <laughs> the dress. She's dreamed of this dress since she was a little girl. And there is not one like it in her whole county. And so she goes with her mom from store to store to store to store, there is not this dress. So they go into the next three counties until they find the dress that she's been dreaming of. And then what do they do with that dress? They take it and they stuff it in a brown grocery sack, put it in the trunk of the car and lug it home, right? Wrong. They hire a U-Haul truck <laughs> to get that dress safely home. And when it gets home, it, she hangs it up in the middle of the room. And if she's got younger brothers and sisters, she puts barbed wire around that dress. <laughs> She's going to protect it. She's going to keep it clean. The dress. She prioritizes time. They're willing to spend money in communicating or traveling to be with each other. She talks about him to others. She doesn't try to keep this a secret. She wants others to know how wonderful he is, whether they care or not, and doesn't care what others think. Here's something else. If it's a healthy relationship, she doesn't date other guys while well, she's engaged, right? She's taken. She's not available and she wears his ring as evidence. This commitment has been made. She de they deal with breaches in the relationship if it's a healthy relationship because she wants to please her beloved. And so we, the bride of Christ, eagerly await and long for the day 
when he will come and take us to himself. It's uppermost on our minds and our hearts. We're consumed with it, waiting and watching for his appearing. We prioritize him. If we're getting ready for the wedding, we're not letting our lives get frittered away with things that don't matter now and certainly won't matter in eternity. We want to be with him. We, we want to spend time with him. We want to live for him. We want to talk about him to others. That's the overflow of a love relationship. And we do what we need to do to plan, to prepare. We want everything to be right for him. And we want the dress, the garments, the righteous acts of the saints to be clean and ready. So we deal with those stains, bitterness, unforgiveness, selfishness, critical spirit, lack of love, temporal values, besetting sins, worry, fear, unbelief, immorality. We want to deal with all those things so that nothing comes between us and our beloved. And by the way, those stains on our wedding garments, those aren't something that we can get rid of ourselves. It takes the blood of Christ to deal with those sin stains in our hearts. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day, and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. So we want to put on our wedding garments. We want them to be clean and white and the righteous acts of the saints. Jesus said to me, it said to the church in Revelation 3, I counsel you to buy from me white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. It's the righteousness of Christ that we are clothed in. Now, as we come to the close of this day, this part of this day, I want to invite you to imagine with me that there's a royal wedding coming. And the invitations are sent out, and they're magnificent. And you've been fortunate enough to get one of those engraved, embossed invitations. And so you've RSVP'd, you've said, we'll be there. And all the arrangements have been made for this wedding. And you get there, and you get into the auditorium, the sanctuary, and there are amazing flowers everywhere. It is just spectacular. And you make your way to your seat, and this music is playing, and it's just luscious. It's rich. It's beautiful. There just aren't words to describe how magnificent this wedding is, and you get to be there. And then the music begins to play for the bride to come down the aisle. And you're sitting kind of over here so you can't see real well and you're doing what everybody else is doing. You're craning your neck because you want to see the bride. Everybody wants to see the bride. The groom has come with the groomsmen. They've taken their places up here. But you want to see the bride. And so you're looking and looking and finally she comes just far enough down the aisle that you can get a glimpse of her and you go, oh, no way. Her, her veil, it's torn and it's not on straight, it's just, it's all askew. And then she gets closer and you can see better. And you see, it's not just her veil, it's her face. I mean, it's dirty, she doesn't have any makeup on. And then you see, it's her dress. It's torn, it's got grass stains all over it, it's wrinkled, it looks like it's never been. Can you imagine such a thing? And then the saddest moment of all, you look in the groom's face and you see his sorrow, his shame, his sadness that his bride didn't care enough to get ready for the wedding. It's unthinkable, isn't it? What a picture that is for us as we prepare for the return of Christ. God has planned a royal wedding. And you're invited, not just to be there, but to be the bride. 
And what is Jesus' goal for all of this? Ephesians tells us that he loved the church and he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The bride ready for the wedding. I have two questions as we come to an end of this session. One, are you part of the bride of Christ? Have you ever said, I do, to Jesus? He wants you to be his bride. He wants you to be a part of the bride of Christ that we call the church. Not just a church member, but to really belong to him. And the fact that you're here this weekend in one of these venues is an evidence that he wants you to belong to him. And God's been speaking to your heart. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. I can't tell by looking who I'm talking about or to, but you know. And his invitation to you today is, would you be my bride? I love you. I've chosen you. I want you to belong to me. Would you do what I did at the age of four, what others have done at the age of 44 or 84? Would you today say, I do. Yes, Lord, I want to be your bride. I'm going to give you an opportunity for that in just a moment. But before I do, there's another question. And that is for those who know that you are a part of the bride of Christ, which I'm assuming would be most who are listening to my voice today. Are you ready for the wedding? And if not, what would you have to do to get ready? Is there a sin you need to confess? Is there a habit, an addiction you need to put away? Is there clutter to clear out of your life that's consuming you, stealing your love for Jesus? Is there a relationship that needs to be reconciled or broken off? What would you need to do to get ready for the wedding? Here comes the bride. What a day that will be when angels shout in unison as Jesus' bride they see. He's planned the perfect wedding. Each detail is in place. And oh, what grand excitement when we but see his face. And know that as the anthems ring and as the trumpets blast, the wedding will take place and then we will be his at last. Here comes the groom our Savior, such patient love he's shown. And now, at last, we'll know him as even we are known. Here come the guests, the multitudes who in God's sovereign plan have come to witness this event that stuns the mind of man. And here comes the bride. What glory in garments pure and white. No sin to mar those garments. She's covered with his light. Here comes the celebration, all grief and sorrow gone. We know this celebration will yet go on and on, for Jesus and his bride will be forever now as one. We are the bride, beloved, engaged to God's own son. So every time the organ plays or wedding bells do chime, dear Christian, pray, Lord Jesus, come. Please hasten, Lord, the time when in the light of your great plan, the ties of earth you'll sever. And at the wedding of the Lamb, we shall be yours forever. Would you pray with me? He's got a royal wedding planned. He's coming soon to take us to live with him forever. And he invites us to come. So could I just re-ask those two questions and let you answer? Are there those here who would say, I know I'm not part of the bride, but I want to be. I want to be. I know you've, I've heard you tell the gospel, the good news, that Jesus loves me, that he gave his life to save me from my sin, that he re delights in me, that he has chosen me. And today, I want to say yes, I do, to Jesus. 
that's true of you and, and you want to give your life to Jesus, you're like that woman at the well, a lady came up to me at the end of the session last night, she was just tears streaming down her face, or maybe it was today, I, I'm losing track, but she said, that woman you talked about to, uh, last night, that was me. An older woman, maybe that's you, and you've never given your life to Jesus. Never trusted him to save you. You may be a church member. You may never have been in a church. You may have been in this church for 30 years or some other or no other. But God brought you here today to show you your need for a Savior and you want to say, yes, Lord. Is there anybody like that in this room or in one of the other venues? Could I just invite you to slip your hand up in the air? And I want to pray for you in just a moment. Yes, over here. Just lift it up long enough for me to see. Someone else, I'm looking over to my right, your left. Thank you. Two women right next to each other. Thank you so much. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. Someone else, I want to be a child of God. I want to be part of the bride of Christ. I want to trust him as my Savior. God's been speaking to me, and I hear him calling, and I want to say yes to him. Someone else, as I'm looking in these middle sections here, just lift your hand. I can't see everyone in the balcony, but I'd love to try if you just would want to lift your hand up in the air long enough for me to see it. Do this in the other venues as well. The Lord sees someone over on my left, your right. I want to trust Christ as my Savior. I'm believing the gospel, receiving him today. Just slip your hand up long enough for me to see it. Yes, all the way in the back. Thank you so much. Someone else, make sure I see your hand. I want to pray for you. Yes, way in the back. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad God spoke to you today. Yes, right here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? So I'm looking around. Maybe I saw your hand. Maybe I didn't. Maybe you're in this venue. Maybe you're in one of the other venues. But could I beg you, as soon as we stand to sing in just a moment, would you go to that prayer room or to one of the prayer people up front here you decide and would you say I'm one of those people who knows I need a savior and I'm, I want to believe in Jesus today would you pray with me I want to encourage you to do that um, the people you came with they will be glad to wait but I want you to just seal the commitment that God is bringing you to today and I wonder how many would say I know I'm a part of the bride of Christ but I'm not ready for the wedding. I know it. I know there are changes that need to be made. I know there are things that need to be confessed, attitudes, actions, words, things I need to make right. Maybe something God spoke to you about this morning. Maybe a forgiveness issue. And you say, I'm not ready, but I want to get ready. And whatever it takes, I want to be ready for the return of my bridegroom. I want to be ready for the wedding. If that's true of you, I'm not ready, but I want to be, and I'm going to, by God's grace, leave from here to get ready. Would you just slip your hand up in the air, and I want to rejoice with you and pray for you. Yes. Lots and lots of hands. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, thank you for your visitation in this place. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for making your love known to us. Thank you, Lord for amazing grace. Thank you that we are loved with an everlasting love. Thank you for our heavenly bridegroom. Thank you for these precious women. Thank you that you've brought us here together to this place this weekend so you could tell us how much you love us. There's single women here thinking, that story of Robert and Nancy, that may be lovely for them, but I've never had anything like that in my life. There are married women who are thinking, I've never had anybody love me in that way. You do have someone who loves you in that way. His name is Jesus. And he's inviting you to enter into the most intimate, beautiful, grace-filled love relationship now and for the rest of your life. Thank you. You can put those hands down. And Lord, I want to pray for those who've said they need a Savior and ask that today would be the day of salvation, that they would belong to you by the end of this day. They would pray, they would trust you, they would trust you to forgive their sins, they would receive you as their Lord and their Savior, the King of their lives, and that you would make them a new person today, part of the bride of Christ. Give them the courage to find someone to talk to 
someone, uh, and in that prayer room, that listen, they want to pray for you, and they want to also just help you know how to go on and take the next step in your relationship with Christ. So please, don't leave before you do that. And oh Lord, you've seen others who've said, I'm not ready for the wedding, but I want to get ready. May we spend the rest of our lives loving, eagerly awaiting, longing for the day of your return. Thank you for that promise that we will be with you forever and ever and ever as your bride. And in the meantime, may your bride reflect the beauty of Christ to those around us so that they too may want to belong to him. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done in our hearts in these hours and pray that you'd continue to seal it to our hearts in the days ahead. I pray in Jesus' name.